we were about to wrestle with New Day in a good little program, and it was going that way. Wow. So Blake and I would have been the SmackDown Tag Team Champions at one point. And, well, what could have been? Steve, thanks so much for joining me. No, thanks for having me. Look at, the, look at the setup you've got here. It's like a shrine to both you yeah. and Deanna. Well, that's mostly Dee's wall now. I just got the <laughs> Forgotten Sun shirt, really. She kind nah, of She was not in the Forgotten Suns. She is not a Forgotten no, Sun. No, she just takes pride that I got a shirt. Uh, well, hey, I, I would take pride in that too. Speaking of shirts, you're wearing is this a Captain America shirt? Oh yeah, I'm I'm a I'm a Marvel Mark. I mean, you're also like a true Captain America. Yeah, well. <laughs> look, I look, I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for anybody who serves the country. So thank you for your service, by the way. No, thank you. Appreciate it. But but the fact that uh, you know, I, I feel like, yeah, if anyone has the right to wear a Captain America shirt, I feel like it, it would be someone like you who served in the United States Marine Corps. Oh, appreciate it. Yeah, I got the nomad beard kind of going right now. So <laughs> has anyone ever told you that you look a little bit like Stephen Amell? No. OK, well, let me then be the first to tell you this. And with, with heels coming out now on Stars, the wrestling TV show. If he's looking for a stunt double, I mean, it's right here, I feel like. Yeah, especially with it being a wrestling show. I'll take all the bumps for him. <laughs> yeah, well, there it is. Fly out to L.A. or where? No, I think they're filming in Atlanta. So there you go. There you go. Yeah, it's one of those uh, one of those shows that's kind of on the radar. Everybody's like, kind of looking into. I remember seeing the preview and I was just like, oh, this, this could be interesting. But especially for a guy who's actually worked in front of a crowd. Like Stephen Amell yeah. has actually had matches. He's not just an actor who's, you know, playing a wrestler. Mm -hmm. It's been exciting watching your journey over these last few months. It's been uh, it's been a weird one, but a fun one. How everything's kind of happened for a reason. And uh, I tell everybody that all the time. Things happened during the past year, and I couldn't be happier where I'm at now uh, with Impact Wrestling. And I know we were chatting before this, but officially signed with Impact Wrestling. Uh, and it's it's awesome. It's a new new venture for me and it's a new family for me there too. And the atmosphere and impact is just great from top to bottom. Yeah. You're one of those people who was able to, you know, really land on your feet after getting released. Yeah. So it's, um, it's funny, like anybody that gets released, everybody's like, Oh man, that sucks. It's not good. Like everybody kind of has that heartfelt thing for, but like a lot of the talents that let's go is especially the talent that's in the past year that's been let go is so freaking talented. Yeah. And a lot of the times you're not allowed to fully flourish there because just the way creative is and yeah. uh, it's a work in process and it's that's the TV show they want. And when you get out and you're able to spread your wings on your own and kind of be free and do what you want to do on your own, obviously working with a promoter or a company itself, but being able to just be out and be able to express yourself on how you vision yourself to look at uh, it's it's a different world. Well, with Deanna working in Impact, you already had a little peek behind the curtain to see how things functioned there. Yeah, so I actually flew in the week that she had Slammiversary, her first match back there when she won the title. And um, that was just kind of cool because I went in for the week. I didn't go to the show or anything, but I just went to get away from Florida in that time. And then a year later, me getting let go and just kind of going the same route a week after I got let go, I went with her to Impact Tapings. Not going there looking for a job, or anything, but I just wanted to get away. I needed to get away from Florida, right away from the, the PC bubble area, because you see everybody from work yeah, uh, all the time. And uh, we went there, and she said, just come to the show. And I was like, yeah, no problem. And then just kind of hit it off, just chatting with Dreamer, not even about wrestling or anything, just talking about uh, Giants football and just history of uh, New York Giants football. And it just, yeah, it was a good spot for me to land, and I'm very happy to be there. So how does the conversation transition from talking about football to talking about like, hey, I think we have something here for you? Um, it really didn't come about at that day. It just obviously word came about uh, towards the company as well. And once they uh, asked me when my 90 days was up on a phone call and email, uh, speaking with D'Lo and uh, Scott uh, Demore, that's kind of just how we went about it the next few days after that. And then we just played the waiting game on my 90 days. And originally I was told uh, after Slammiversary, I'd be making a, a debut. And then not even two days after that phone call, they said, hey, we're going to bring you in before Slammiversary and get the ball rolling early. I was like, no problem. Ready to go to work. So did you have an idea in your mind of who you wanted Steve Cutler, the character to be? Or did you take those 90 days to go, all right, I want to do what I wasn't able to do in NXT? 
So for me as Steve Macklin now, uh, Cutler's dead. <laughs> He's dead and gone now. But um, for Steve Macklin, I already had the ideas of where I wanted to go. And for years, pitching and being in the performance center with the creative process there, being under the tutelage of Dusty Rhodes and Ryan Katz was there for creative. And then uh, Joe Belcastro, one of the head writers, used to come down all the time. And even Paul Heyman. Uh, I always had ideas. I just have notepads and notes on my actual iPhone where I just have all these just old promos, old ideas where I just wanted to put together what I am and how I envision myself. And I pretty much just took a little bit from the Punisher and then just took who I am all into one. And it mixes with the background of being a Marine, taking that dark side of the Punisher and trying to manipulate it into myself and just be me. Uh, that's the fun part is being a character that's just me. I like that we have a cameo from one of your dogs in the background here. Oh, uh, it's just honey. It's, she's just roaming around. Fitz is sitting over here. I love here. it. This is great. Yeah. This is great. You know, uh, John Cena sprinkled a little bit of like Marine stuff into his gimmick. For mm -hmm. you, this is authentic. Yeah. And that's always one of those things too. Uh, it was always told to us here in NXT is like they wanted characters for so long. And then after a while it became, we need personality and we need to just turn that up a little bit. So where it is you, but it is a character where it comes off that way. And that was one thing I always took pride in is like just staying true to who I am. Mm. If we go back here, was your first passion wrestling? Was it serving your country or was it something completely different? Uh, well, 9-11 uh, is kind of what got me into uh, pretty much wanting to join. And uh, I was a freshman in high school. And then I think I kind of knew at that time what I wanted to do after high school, even though I wanted to play football. Um, but 9-11 was one of those moments in my life that had a big impact being a kid from Jersey and being seeing the twin towers and everything from those days uh, and watching them fall. And, uh, it's one of those things where I kind of knew what I wanted to do and where my calling was going to, mm. and I did it. And that was one thing I loved. And, uh, it's funny that I have a few friends that were on independence scene wrestling. And when I came home on leave one weekend, uh, Darren Young, uh, Fred, now was with one of my buddies, Jared's at a, one of the hometown bars in East Rutherford at the railroad. And it was just funny. He said, Hey, you want to talk to one of my buddies that's in WWE? I'm like, hell yeah. Like he knew I loved wrestling growing up and he always tried to get me in a ring. And I just was like, there's no way I, there, you could ever make that happen. Like I'm not six, three, 255 pounds and above. I'm not stone cold. I'm not Hulk Hogan. I'm not like, there's no way. And uh, just speaking with Fred, it was just one of those things where he just got that idea in my head. He's like, when you get out, he's like, you're going to, you'll have a good story. You already have a good story. He's like, just give it a shot when you get out. And if this is something you want to do and pursue, just go all in about it. And one of the few things he did tell me too, was never change who you are and uh, just kind of stick to who you are and don't let the business change you. And that was one of those things that stuck with me and still sticks with me now. And then I try to pass that on to people as well nowadays. But um, once I got out of the Marine Corps, I started going to school school at Rowan University. Sorry. Me do. Me do. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> They're playing with a ball. Sorry. They want to be part of the interview too. I know. But <laughs> <laughs> but uh, once I was going to school at Rowan University in South Jersey, uh, I was moving back with my parents and uh, I found the Monster Factory in Paulsboro, New Jersey. And I got in the ring and I fell in love instantly. Mm. Uh, we... It was just, it's just was an instant, like no matter what, I feel like a big kid every day in my life for what I do. Yeah. And it's the most fun in the world. Uh, and it's also, I don't know, nowadays it's very less stressful, I will say, which is great. But uh, yeah, to answer that, it's just one of those things. I didn't know at that time that something I knew I could have done or wanted to do, but I fell in love with wrestling as soon as I stepped in a ring. You know, you mentioned 9-11 and it's crazy to think that's 20 years ago next month. Yeah. So if we go back to September 11th, 2001, where were you and how did that news hit you? Uh, I was actually in the homeroom uh, on our way to school. Uh, my buddy Tim, his mom used to drive me to school all the time. Uh, my parents were always working, so they weren't home. So they always got me the ride to school and we we're kind of listening over the radio on the way to school. We got to homeroom. And I remember just sitting there and it was one of those moments where we grew up so close to the city, not even 20 minutes out. Hey, come on. Grew up 20 minutes outside of New York City. Let me get them out of here. Real quick. Okay. <laughs> get the ball. Get go. Get. Just a, a nice little cameo there from the dogs. Yeah. They will fight over one toy. If they both have the same toy, they want the other's toy like normal kids would. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was in homeroom. And it was just one of those things growing up. 
20 minutes outside the city. And I had a lot of friends whose families worked there, uncles, aunts, and it, uh, it really affected that whole area, the whole, the country in general, but just anywhere near outside of New York city within that 50 mile radius was just, uh, it's crazy. And how did you decide in that moment? All right, I want to do something. I need to make a difference here. I don't know. It was just the time and time. If I could have joined that day, I probably would have at 15, 16, wow, but yeah, uh, yeah um, I don't know. Can't tell you. I don't know. I grew up in a military family, so it was always kind of bred into me. Uh, my dad was in the army. My uncle was a Marine. And then my grandfather was in the army as well. So it's one of those things. Military was always a, just a thing in the household, watching full metal jacket and reenacting with toy guns in the backyard and playing with my army figures and whatnot outside. And, but yeah, I don't know. I can't tell you. Just something I just felt like I had to do, and I did. Yeah. So growing up in an army family, does that mean you were traveling around a whole bunch as a kid? No, no. My dad got out. My uncle got out, and uh, we were home in Jersey. My grandparents uh, had the house in, in uh, Rutherford. So my dad, uh, I want to say my dad was at five years when he before he got medically discharged, and then uh, my uncle, not too sure on the time of his service. I know he got discharged as well, but um, yeah, different different time. Yeah. So is this for you basically like you graduated from high school and you're like, there's no question what I'm doing next. I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to go enlist. I tried college for a year. Uh, my mom begged me because I was ready to go to the recruiter in 2005. And uh, friggin' uh, Iraq was awful at that time. And Fallujah was kicking off. And of course, it was all over the news. So my mom just begged me, please try college. And I did and didn't like college at first. It wasn't for me and it wasn't what I wanted to do. And then uh, one day I was working at my dad's uh, supply office. He's a locksmith. My stepdad uh, is a locksmith office in uh, Bloomfield. And the recruiter was right down the street. And I, I went at lunch one day and I just said, screw this. I walked in. I said, I want to leave this date right after Thanksgiving. I was like, I want to go infantry. Don't need to do anything else. You don't have to sell me on anything. Because they usually have to give you the recruiting standpoint. Yeah, like, yeah. And it was a very easy process, but it was just for me being an only child was a pain in the butt just because I had to take the paperwork to my parents and you have to sign off because technically I'm the last in my bloodline uh, with my name. So it's one of those things you have to sign off as an only child. But uh, my dad, my stepdad knew what I wanted to do. And then my mom just was upset, but it all changed once I went to boot camp and graduated, just saw me in uniform and rest is history. I, I, you're like the recruiter's dream when you walk in there, you know? Yeah, you're, like, you're, you're right. Most of them are like trying to sell you on the idea. You're just like, nope, that, I'm good. I know what I want to do. Wow. Is Hell Week as crazy as everyone makes it out to be? Uh, boot camp uh, for Camp Lejeune, or not Camp Lejeune, uh, Paris Island. I was a Paris Island Marine. Uh, you have Paris Island and then uh, MCRD out in California. Uh, but um, I take more pride being from Paris Island where the real Marines are bred. Uh, but um. <laughs> What, it, I don't know. Just I kind of went in better shape than I expected. And then I came out out of shape. If that makes any sense. Cause it, you don't that realize not you make think, any sense. No, <laughs> no. You think like the first three weeks were pretty much more of the physical part of it. And then afterwards it kind of turns into just mostly drill and learning the history, learning how to clean your weapon, taking proper care. And then just pretty much the three month breakdown of boot camp and trying to break you down as an individual and getting you that brainwashed Marine. And are you seeing people all around you just dropping like flies? No, surprisingly, no, there wasn't that many. And if usually you drop off, you just drop into the next platoon at that time. That's kind of how it works at boot camp. I don't know how it works nowadays, but um, yeah, I expected it to be a lot worse just because, like I said, growing up watching Full Metal Jacket or watching the movie Jarhead, you see like the boot camp videos and then it just kind of Mothers of America kind of took over a little bit and uh, affected a little bit of boot camp style. So at what point do you start thinking about what's next after, you know, serving your country, after being a Marine? At what point during that process? Uh, my second deployment was when I was kind of really contemplating my career in the military. Uh, so I originally enlist, uh, tried to re-enlist with a MESET package, which was pretty much the cross deck from being enlisted side to officer side. So I would have had my MESA package in where I would technically go to OCS, but then also go to college at the same time, which would have let me finish my college career. And then if I was going to make a career, be an officer. Uh, but at that time, uh, the tattoo policy wasn't very, uh, was very strict. So anything below the sleeve was pretty much denied. So once I get denied that, I just said, all right, screw it. I'll get out and go back to college, make use of the GI Bill and uh, let's go wrestle. 
Wow. And then, okay. So then you start wrestling. What are the steps that you start taking there? Uh, I'm very fortunate for the time that it took. Uh, Cause I was only training for about a year and a half in when I got signed. Uh, wow. So it's we're, we're a different world, but I was at the monster factory about a year and a half. And um, Danny cage got Gerald Briscoe in there to do a tryout and seminar uh, July of 2013. And, uh, you know, July of 2013, I had my tryout with WWE that August of 2013. And then I was signed in October and then made the move and came to Florida in January of 2014. This is not how it normally goes for most people. No, but at that time, like NXT's landscape was so different because it was just yeah. starting to get built. And they were saying they didn't want independent talent and big names. And the tryout I was at was like 60 guys. And I did not expect to. Like get signed from because you had a ton of guys there like you had eddie edwards freaking davy richards uh todd Han uh, well ivar was there um a bunch of people were there. um stop ali was there uh there were so many talent keith lee was at my tryout though i think that was one of his first ones and it's just crazy to come out of that and then a few months later to just get signed as i was on my way to go do extra work uh, with WWE as well. And it was just kind of funny to get that call. And uh, I was just, all right, sweet. We're moving to Florida. Wow. Especially when so many of those guys, like you just mentioned, had to do multiple tryouts with WWE. Yeah. It's, it's such a weird process. I you can't, everybody's got their story. And that's sure. the one thing like I learned a lot too at the PC was that everybody that comes in, whether they love wrestling at the beginning or not, they end up liking it if they're there a long time, but uh, which you hope they do. Um, but everybody has their different story. And I think that's the one thing they're trying to go for as well. in that culture is they have so many different backgrounds coming in that that's what makes NXT what it is. I mean, you trained at one of the best wrestling schools in the country at the monster factory. What did you learn? Or like when you went to the PC, what did you have to go? Oh crap. I need to know this now. It was just getting the experience of uh, working television, obviously. Yeah. And then also getting the actual match and rep experience. Cause I was maybe about 30 matches before, when I got to the performance center. And uh, I just started right as before I got signed was just starting to branch out and do independent, like get out of the factory and do independence, mostly in Delaware and uh, Pennsylvania area. And I was trying to get my name out there as well for extra bookings. But Briscoe told me, he's like, don't take any other bookings, stay here, work on the basics, just keep doing what you're doing. And I'll take care of you. I was like, no problem. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you listen to that? like Cheryl Briscoe telling you to do that. And he's a talent, like one of the top talent scouts at that time for WWE. So it's just like, yeah, yes, sir. Yeah. Was it Gerald Briscoe who was the one who really saw something in you or was it one of the trainers when you went to the tryout who kind of, uh, you, know, you caught their eye? I would say Briscoe bringing me in. And then uh, even the trainers at that time, like were Billy Guns, Sarah Mata was still there at that time. Wasn't a full head coach yet, but she was there. Uh, DeMott, um, Norman Smiley was there, Terry Taylor, uh, Steve Kern was still there. Um, but at that time, like, it was just a weird, it was, I don't know. I took it all in at first. Cause that magical, like Disney, like when you first time you go to Disney, it was like the first time you go to the form say, Oh wow, this is great. Yeah. And after a few months actually being there, you're just like, ah, oh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also, you know, with your background and going through boot camp, th there's no way they can break you. You know, I've, I've heard that the first few days or weeks at the PC is just like, you know, intense cardio workouts. You're probably just like, oh, this, this is it. That is easy. Yeah. I would say the trials were a lot different during the DeMont time compared to the Bloom time, but they're still very uh, strenuous in the body. And uh, they're very, they, they make you want to get after it. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, when did you start to craft your character there? Uh, early on, I kind of was just being me. And that's the one thing Dusty wanted to do. A lot of times at promo classes, because uh, that place was, they had promos Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. And I went to every one of those. I only would cut Monday, Tuesday, and then like the higher classes, like whoever was on TV was there on Wednesdays. So you just sit and watch and kind of learn. But then it's kind of funny to see from the people that were on top in NXT when I first got there to where everybody is now, where most aren't even with the company anymore, or some are like on top still. So it's kind of crazy to see. But um, for me, crafting the character was kind of just getting in the mirror room and just kind of going to movies and watching movies and picking pieces and seeing what works. And the one thing I was trying to do for a while was America's greatest son, where I was just pretty much just being a naive, cynical veteran, pretty much going the heel route of, uh, Oh, you want to thank me for my service now? That's cool. 
and uh, just just being an ass. <laughs> Everyone loves part. playing the heel. Oh, being a heel is the best thing in the world. <laughs> Comes natural. Yeah. So, uh, who came up with the name? Uh, for Steve Cutler uh, at that time, it was a list, and Byron Saxton at that time was in charge of in the office of getting everybody's names together. And uh, I remember turning in like 50 names, three multiple times. So three different lists. And then the final list that came back to me had uh, Alton Wolf was A L T O N Wolf with an E or Steve Cutler. I was like, I'll take Steve Cutler. It's got my actual name in it. So. Wow. Well, so those names, I, I obviously, you know, after 50 tries, those that's what you guys came up with. What was your, like, what was the top of your list? What was the name you really wanted? I don't know. I want to say Duke something was up there. I want, I love the name Duke just because I was thinking GI Joe and just comical stuff. But then like after a while, once Steve Cutler came back and one of my buddies told me, he's like, just put like your name, whatever your name you want to have fit you put in a name of like a Bret Hart, Stone Cold, Shawn Michaels, put your name in there between that. And then like keep going with other names too, mm. of like Undertaker. And like, if you see that on a piece of paper, does it fit? Like mm. that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, it totally makes sense. So it's like, yeah, Bret Hart, Stone Cold, Alton Wolf, Shawn Michaels. Like it's like, ah, it doesn't kind of ring. Yeah. So it's just like I you try to Wolf. find those names that like you want something to like kind of last a long time. And as a lot of people think of generic names as being generic after a while, like John Cena at one time was a generic name and then it yeah. became a household name and then the company's name. Yeah. Well, at that time, almost 20 years ago, there weren't a lot of people who had normal no. names. Kurt no. Angle. Randy Orton, Bret Hart, there weren't many. Dave Batista. Uh, he wasn't Dave Batista. No, he was just Batista. And they spelled his last name differently. Yeah, so it's 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 yeah, it's different times. And I don't know. I think more of the, like I said earlier, like towards characters now, everybody wants to be able to relate more. So yeah. having a regular name kind of I think fits better than some over the top gimmick. Well, the name you have now works perfectly. Yep, being Steve Macklin is uh, I took. Tommy Macklin, which I started off on the Indies with, which people for some reason think that's my real name. It's not. Uh, yeah, let's let's clear that up right now. Yeah, my actual name is Steve Kubrick or Steven Kubrick. So I took Steve from Steve Cutler, kept that, which helped me. And then now I took the Macklin from the Tommy Macklin and brought them both together. So now I am officially Steve Macklin. You could have a great Stanley Kubrick gimmick if you wanted. Could, or I would have just been some Russian spy is there, or- <laughs> Is there any What's relation? That? To the great Stanley Kubrick? No, unfortunately, no. You just have genius in other areas that, you know, he had genius in filmmaking. You have genius in other areas. Yeah. And, and since you mentioned film earlier, and that was some of your inspiration for your character, what were some of the films that really, you know, inspired you? Uh, well, like I said, watching Punisher and just kind of taking ideas from the shows. Like now it's like Marvel. Like yeah, Marvel okay. is my go-to on anything wrestling related for how they kind of if you watched it from the first iron man all the way through now and even the shows that are coming out how they just have the writing is just layers and layers of different characters introducing a character here in this story where it's technically five years ago but now we have to go back to the present and i i love that because it's it's pro wrestling if you think I, about it i watched a recent interview with john barenthal and he was talking about how like deeply he dove into the character of the punisher and I feel like, I mean, how could you not be inspired by that? No, it, that's the one thing too, is like you try to do these, uh, well, we took some acting classes too all my time at the performance center as well. And then trying to get into that method acting of how to find that like thing in your head or that moment in your life that you can relate to and attach to a certain situation. And that was always a fun thing to do too. And now I try to do that as well with promos and even with the vignettes I put out when I got out and was released which Impact ended up using, which I loved so much because it just was kudos to my investment on that. But, yeah. um, which was a lot of fun for me because it allowed me and have my creative juices going. And then it just made me feel like, I'm like, wow, I'm actually doing me for once and nobody's bugging me about it. Yeah. After working on your character and putting in the reps in the PC, where do you feel like you really made your biggest splash in NXT? When, once Blake and I started tagging, uh, Weston Blake now. Um, but once he and I started tagging and getting that, uh, we were originally the Forgotten Sons. We were trying to be POS, Prisoners of the System, which then that was turned down because we were trying to play towards uh, the gimmick of here we are stuck in this system where you have all these new indie guys are coming in. Nothing against them. It's just the way the place was working at that time. And here we are. And we're just trying to make that into a real life situation. 
and that's where we kind of had fun. And that's where we both kind of, well, at least for me, I let go of just caring for everything to be perfect in wrestling. Uh, once Blake and I started tagging all the time and the road shows and we just had fun. Like, I don't know. I just, I stopped caring so much about the perfection of a match to be 100% from beginning to end and things are going to go wrong. And that's yeah, I, usually the, the fun I, part is. The part is. Ironically, you're called the forgotten sons because you yes. felt like you guys were overlooked. And then I feel like there was a point when you guys were actually being overlooked as the forgotten sons. Yeah. I, uh, there was a few times I felt like, obviously you, you want to be at the top. You want to be attacked. You want to be a champion. And there was times where the ball I thought was kind of dropped on where we could have went, but it's also just the creative mind of what Hunter had at that time uh, of where he wanted to go. Uh, especially like the, the dusty classics we had against Alistair Black and uh, Ricochet. Did it make sense for them to go over at that time? Probably. But at the same time, I didn't think so. And the booking standpoint, just because you knew they just got called up, that news came out like a week prior. So now they're scrambling for that. And then they go to the finals just where they're going to have a great match with the War Raiders at that time or the Viking Raiders. Um, and they went out and killed it. But at the same time, you could have just built another team with a team that's so high up on the friggin' card as a tag team, as the War Raiders. And they get called up like not even the next week either. And it's mm. just, it's mm. insane. But that's, you can't control that. How did it go from being a tag team to being a trio and adding in Jackson Riker? Uh, I'll blame Steve Carino for that one. Um, we were on a live event. I want to say it was in Maryland. And uh, we were either Maryland or Pennsylvania, one of those two. But uh, we just randomly had to do a six man. And it was great. We came back and they said, what do you think? Like Carino was like, you guys kind of all three look good together. He looks, got the beer. He's kind of grungy looking. Okay, cool. When we got back to TV uh, the following week for tapings uh, with NXT and uh, Hunter said, hey, we're going to go with this. Okay. Whatever you say, boss. <laughs> no problem. And then, so that's it. It just like that just yeah. changed overnight. Yeah. And then uh, we took a little bit more time to wait to get debuted. And then we debuted against the Street Profits. And uh, was that October? I've, my years and time frame now is so, so gone on that end. But we debuted in like the September, October time frame that year when we became the Forgotten Sons. I talked to Wesley recently. He was on the show a few weeks ago. And he went into pretty deep detail about the tweets that Jackson Riker sent. What was mm. your opinion of those? Uh, well, to be fair, like when I got the texts from everybody of what was going on, I, we were literally walking the dogs. Uh, and it's just a, it's a crappy situation because that's just the way the world is now and how you view things and what you say is going to either offend somebody or not offend somebody. And in that situation, he can have his viewpoints on the world. And that's why Blake and I distance ourselves very quickly because we don't feel that way. Um, nothing against him. He's allowed to say what he wants to say. He's a free man. And that's the point of social media. You can say what you want to say, but obviously in today's cancel culture of the world, things don't work out that way. Um, do I agree with everything he said? Not at all. Um, but I also stand on the way I feel. And that's why, again, we distance ourselves quickly. And it's a situation I look back at now that kind of sparked to where I am nowadays. And I, at the time I was angry. Now I can care less because I'm a lot happier and a lot freer. It seemed to be such a momentum killer. Like things were going so well for you guys as the Forgotten <laughs> Sons. We and were about to win the tag titles. You were about to win the tag titles. Yeah. We were about to wrestle with New Day in a good little program. And it was going that way. Wow. So Blake wow. and I would have been the SmackDown tag team champions at one point. And well, what could have been? But it's just unfortunate that something that had nothing to do with your current storyline, nothing to do with your current characters affected your characters. Uh, round down range. Can't do anything about it. Yeah, I guess that's it. Yeah, but I also, how how did you guys get released and he didn't? Couldn't tell you. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. But, you know, circling back to what you said at the start of this, everything happens for a reason. And you know, it yeah. might have been super frustrating at the time to deal with you know, that situation with Jackson or to deal with the release, but things are going pretty well for you now. Yeah, I can't complain. Like, granted, like the best part about 
with WWE is you're in WWE and I always wanted to be a household name. And I thought I would have had my career there. And you look at sports across the board. Now everything's a business the loyalty and anything is gone. Uh, it's all business and it's all numbers. Um, so it's one of those things where at that time I would have loved to have stayed in WWE made a career in WWE and who wouldn't want like, cause I grew up loving WWE, but now like I see the brighter picture and I've seen the corporate world of what it is. And, and especially in pro wrestling nowadays, but for where I'm at now, I'm extremely happy in impact wrestling. Couldn't be happier. And it's, it's fun too, to have more of the creative input on my end as well. Yeah. It feels like you can be whoever you want to be with your character yeah. impact. And that's the one thing too. Impact is very big on the characters. They're very character driven and very story based driven. Granted WWE and NXT are, but I just think impact kind of sticks to those stories a little bit more that and longer, at least too, than, uh, for what's going on with uh, current products. There's so many talented people there too. So yeah, from, from top to bottom, like, I know it was funny, like to, from when I even got there, Deanna's like, how do you know all these people? I was like, well, half of them I've either worked with before they've been in NXT or I've done their tryouts. So it's kind of like funny to like, everything's just full circle in pro wrestling. You're the same people you're meeting on the way up or the same people you meet on the way down and back up again. So who is it that you want to have a match with and show the world, show the impact fans what you can really do in the ring? Uh, currently right now, my goal is the X division championship and uh, holder of that right now is Josh Alexander. Uh, really looking forward to something down the road with him, possibly if he actually wants to step up. I keep telling him on Twitter, say when, uh, but uh, right now uh, my, my eyes are set on PD Williams. Uh, he wanted to kind of get involved in some of my stuff uh, with what I wanted to do trade Miguel, but um, he just couldn't leave it alone. So that's why I came out at homecoming and dropped him on his head. <laughs> is the goal, you know, maybe two years from now, three, five, whatever it is, do you want to hold a world heavyweight championship? That's the goal anywhere. Yeah. If you're, if you're not in a, in the business to be a champion, I don't know what you're trying to do. Yeah. Also, you got to hang it up next to Deanna's behind oh, yeah. you. Though. I got, she's going to be, she's, well, she's down in uh, triple main. She's going to out freaking class me probably here soon with two <laughs> yeah she's she's had a, a heck of a run over the last she's killing so. it she's another one of the talents like i said everybody that gets let go it's just crazy what you see them do and how you land on their feet and that's also i think a testament to it of the people that are like oh and what they do afterwards nowadays and she has just been killing it and i'm so proud of her every day she just she busts her ass she always has and it's you don't see a lot of the behind the scenes i don't think fans realize that too but she just, she works her ass off every day. How did you guys meet, by the way? Uh, our time in NXT. Uh, and then we just kind of hit it off. And uh, she lived one apartment above or uh, below me in our old place. And then, uh, yeah, just kind of got together. Is this the apartment building where like literally everybody from NXT lives? No, you know the one, no, you know the one I'm talking nowadays. about. Everybody's very spread out nowadays. It's kind of funny uh, for how that all changed from the original days. But yeah, once uh, we started kind of just seeing each other, and she, I, I was always very persistent. She was standoffish at first, too. And then, um, yeah, so we've been together about two years now. How did you eventually convince her, no, 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 it's a good idea to go on a date with me? Um, I don't know. It just kind of happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She was like, uh, we finally looked at each other at one point and we we're just like, so are we dating? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah. We're, we it haven't was, really put like a, we're it very, started off very as very friends and colleagues first. Yeah. Are you looking forward to, I mean, this could happen in impact. Are you looking forward to maybe having a match with her? Uh, no, uh, my, my stance on, uh, she knows my stance on wrestling with females. I, I personally don't ever want to put my hands on a female. I uh, just was raised that way. And that's my viewpoints on it. Yeah. People can have their opinions on that too. But uh, would we work together possibly down the road? Yes. But she's obviously now a queen with uh, the king, uh, the drama king. And um, so they're doing their thing, which is great. And she knows where I'm at and where I want to do and what my goals are and me being who I am. And I'm, like I said, X Division title right now is my goal. Yeah. How much of who you are now was shaped by those years that you spent in the military? I would say a lot. I didn't think about it then. Nowadays, I'm, the older I get, I feel like the wiser I get because I just keep my mouth shut and kind of like, oh, okay, this makes sense. 
I think a lot of people do that when they get older at some point where you just become a lot quieter and you just realize, oh, all right, this is a life lesson here at this point. But um, the hurry up and wait game, I think helped me out a lot uh, from being military to wrestling. Cause it's the same thing anywhere you go in wrestling, everything's hurry up and wait. Um, being patient and just being able to adapt to certain situations when things go wrong or things even go not as planned where they actually work out and you just kind of adapt to it and you just keep, keep the ball rolling with it and bad things are going to happen. Good things are going to happen, but no matter what, there's a lot of outcomes that you can't control. And that's probably one of those things too, is like, you don't have to worry about everything you can't control, worry about what you can yourself. And I think that's where a lot of my life now, I just kind of focus on is what I can control, what I can control for our family, the dogs, me, D and this house. So that's really it. It's interesting that you say that now you've learned as you're older to just kind of shut your mouth and let things be. When you're younger, you feel like you think you know absolutely everything. You think right. you know it all. And then you get into your 30s and you go, oh, I didn't know anything at all. No, no. And then you realize your parents didn't know anything at all. Yeah. And they're just everything figuring is it just, out as they go. Everything's just calling it on the fly in life. And it's great. Yeah. That's... You're literally just feel like, okay, cool. And then you see something stupid happening and you're just like, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to worry about that. But you're right. All you can worry about are the things that you actually have control over. And yeah. what you have control over is how you want to react to the things that are happening in front of you. Oh, yeah. And that's the one thing, too. That's why, like, with social media, I try to just promote. I don't really try to be very interactive on Twitter just because of the way the world is. You know, if you're going to upset somebody and, like, you never – I don't ever have the intent to try to upset somebody if I said something in a tweet or something, but you never know what anybody's going to do nowadays. So now it's just like – yeah, I'm just going to use this to promote wrestling, what shows I'm on, my merchandise, and promote Impact Wrestling. And then that's kind of it. The dogs. I, I, if you're on my Instagram, you see more of my dogs than anything. This is, there is a lot of dog photos on there. Yeah, I, that's just my go-to now. I'm just like, yeah, this is a little bit of my life. And people, I think other people, you know, Deanna Parazza fans want to see photos of her that maybe you would post that she hasn't posted. Yes, and normally at times it's a photo that we've taken 50 million different times because the angle or the lighting wasn't correct. But usually I'll get yelled at for the photo that she didn't like and vice versa. Sometimes I'm like, oh, I don't like that photo. She's like, yeah, but I look good. I'm like, oh, okay. And cool. then it doesn't matter, Steve. It really doesn't matter where you look. No, like. just like, whatever. Do you think at all about what, what you want to do after wrestling? It's always the question because... Uh, they used to have classes at the PC where they'd have financial people come in and like, oh, this is for life after wrestling to get prepared. It's just like, well, my goal is wrestling. Like yeah. my mind isn't 100% on wrestling. Um, I would love to be involved more in the veteran community, um, helping out that way. Um, I've actually, once I was let go, I was applying to a bunch of jobs at the VA uh, with mm -hmm. my buddy Tanner was helping me out in that process, but uh, something to be involved more with the veteran community and helping uh, a lot of people with PTSD and any type of counseling. I would love to, get more involved in that end just because like I've been there, I've been down in the dumps where life sucks. And I don't know. I don't, I think that's a part of the world that a lot, well, a lot of the times people forget about forgotten sons. And that's kind of also where the forgotten sons is kind of based off of too, of kind of finding a way of like, Oh, you forgot about us in every aspect of life. And those are the people who technically you shouldn't forget. Yeah. How much of PTSD did you deal with when you went back to, you know, the quote unquote real world? Um, it was just getting acclimated back in the real world. Um, like everybody has post-traumatic stress from anything in, in their life. There's always a moment. It's not just a war thing. Um, but my thing was just adjusting back into the real world and dealing with people again. And from going from a combat situation and coming back to real life and then hearing people complain and bitch about certain things that really aren't relevant because like, again, you can't control, but they're going to complain anyway. But it's just one of those things too, again, another tool that I've taken is where I just, I don't know, things don't bother me as much anymore. Mm. Um, but yeah, I had my moments. I still, I think I still have my moments here and there, but like, that's where I text my buddies. I, I two of my best friends, Barry and Reigns, we text constantly or call constantly. And then even just talking to Dee, she's the first person in my life I've been ever to just kind of just chat with and she's open ears with everything. And she'd be like, you want to talk about it? I'm like, no, I'm just letting you know I'm not in a good mood. Yeah. I, I certainly can't relate from a firsthand perspective, but I've heard that when you come back from combat, it's a big adrenaline adjustment. Is that accurate? Yeah, it is. Cause you had that adrenaline dump all the time. It's like, that's why I think that's why I also loved wrestling. 
Yeah. I fell in love with it. Like anytime before, I'm like my adrenaline's through the roof. And then I, I'm up till three, four in the morning and trying to come down from that high of that adrenaline rush for like being in front of a crowd and having fun with it. But um, it's just getting that excitement again. And I think that's one thing wrestling helped me out too. Once I got into wrestling, um, it took my mind off of a lot of other things and just gave me life again and more of a purpose once I was out and it was fun. I mean, if wrestling was the thing to take your mind off of everything, how did you handle when, when things really hit hard with COVID and you weren't on the road like you were normally on the road? How did you deal with it? Uh, I just kind of went with it. Again, can't control it. <laughs> I love this. Yeah. It was just like, so it was a real weird time as well, too, because we were just getting called up and we were supposed to debut technically before Mania or after Mania, we weren't told. But we got told... Uh, Mid-February, Blake and I and Riker, we got pulled aside before we wrestled the Grizzly Young Veterans that this is going to be our last match, make them look good because you guys are going to SmackDown. I laughed in Hunter's face. I was like, ah, I was like, hell yeah, get us out of here. It's been seven years. <laughs> but um, it was a great moment. And then uh, once kind of COVID hit, we had a couple uh, live events left to do in NXT uh, on the road in Coconut Shows down here in Florida. Yeah. And that's when COVID kind of started canceling everything. And then everything moved to the PC. And then they said, hey, we're going to bring you guys in uh, right after Mania. You guys are getting called up. And then, of course, we debut on the PC with no crowd. Granted, awesome moment to debut on SmackDown, but not in the building that we were just stuck in for the past seven and a half to seven years each. You're right. Yeah. So, but um, yeah, just it's what happens. And like I said, we had the ball rolling. We hit the ground running once we got called up. And then uh, the tweets went out. Hmm. I, I love though your attitude of the idea that you can only control what you can control. And I think that this is why you've been as successful as you have been thus far. And it's why you're going to continue to be successful in your life and in your career. Thank you. Yeah, no, I just, I don't know. I think, I think everybody has an athletic standpoint when you're in that plat or in that, uh, I can't even think of the word, but uh, when you're on that spectrum of just being a professional, professional athlete in a certain way like i just you got to worry about you control what you can take care of your family and everything kind of just falls in the line and i i think it goes across the board in life in general for anybody just do the best you can what you can control and if things are going to go bad things are going to go good just enjoy it when it happens and then learn from it when it doesn't yeah i think it's also important with that in mind to remember that what's happening right now is only what's happening right now. This is not reflective of how things are going to be tomorrow or next week or next month. Yeah. Uh, you, it's just, everything's ever changing and just yeah. do what you can. I love it, man. I end every interview with the same question. I talk about gratitude because it's something that just drives my life. And I'm mm -hmm. curious for you, Steve, what are three things in your life that you're grateful for right now? Uh, my family. I have a very supportive family uh, from top to bottom with my mom, my stepdad, and then D. Uh, and, and the dogs. And the dogs, too. But you just have uh, just my family in general, even my cousins, my aunts, and my uncles. Everybody's always been supportive of what I've done. And they knew what I wanted to do as being a professional wrestler. And once I started doing it, they just said, you're all in on it. Just keep doing you. Um, that's definitely number one is my family. And then I'm grateful for my house, uh, for my time with WWE to be able to afford the house that I live in and Deanna and I live in and take care of it that way. Um, and just wrestling in general, I'm very grateful for professional wrestling. It's, it's again, paid for my house. It's paid many things forward in life and then many things it's given me. And I try to give back to it so much. As much as I can, anytime I'm out there performing, I try to be the best that I can be. Well, I'm so excited to see what's next for you in Impact. I think uh, that, I mean, there are endless possibilities for you there. There's a lot of people there I'm, I'm looking forward to working with too. And that's the one fun part is it's a new roster. The roster, again, from top to bottom is so damn talented. And like, even if you look around at it too, I was having a conversation with somebody there, the, uh, the last tapings. And it, they even said like, this is the first time looking at an impact from top to bottom where it looks like a professional wrestling show with the way everybody looks, everybody, present, everybody presents themselves as a star. Everybody, it just, everything is, I love it there. I can't, there's not one complaint in me about it of being there and the atmosphere that it has. And it's just a good where everybody wants to go out, kick ass, everybody look good at the same time and put on a great show. Love it. Steve. Thank you so much. This has been fantastic. No, oh, thank you, Chris. This is great. Again, hopefully we get to do it again soon. Let's do it in person next time. That'd be great. 
I would love Done. to do it. More, more in-person interviews are better than Zoom. Oh, my gosh. You're telling me. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, man. Thank you.